In this video, we're going to explain what would happen to the different types of memory if the hippocampus was removed using HM as an example. Now, why are we using HM as an example? Because he had his hippocampus removed in order to prevent seizures. There's also another video that I did not make, but I found for you online that you'll be watching that will also hopefully help you to get you to understand what would happen to our different types of memory if our hippocampus was removed. This is an important video as you have an assignment that um, requires you to reflect on this question. So HM, we talked a little bit about him previously. Um, here's a picture of him now, and he basically taught us most of what we know about um, memory in modern times. So he had his hippocampus removed to prevent epileptic seizures, and so this is showing you here, this is where the hippocampus would be in a normal brain, and this is what HM's brain looked like. And what happened is when he woke up from the surgery, it seemed like everything was great, but he had this impaired storage of new long-term memories. So what type of amnesia did HM have? Did he have anterograde amnesia or did he have retrograde amnesia? Think back to the previous video that discussed those different types of amnesia. So he had impaired storage of new long-term memories. He could not form memories after the brain damage. That's going forward, that is anterograde amnesia. He couldn't describe any experience after his surgery, um, and he didn't remember most facts after his surgery. He did remember experiences before. So this idea that he had anterograde amnesia, the inability to form new memories after the, uh, his hippocampus was removed, suggested the hippocampus is vital for the formation of new long-term memories. And this is something we didn't know before his hippocampus was removed. Now, the question is, is, is it for all types of long-term memories? So we'll discuss the specific type of long-term memory in a minute. Is it all those types that we talked about, procedural, semantic, and episodic, or is it just one or two types? So again, here's that hippocampus, which HM had removed. So HM also had slightly blurry memories for events that happened a few years leading up. Now, some accounts say that he couldn't remember anything 10 years prior. Some accounts say that things were kind of blurry. Um, but the idea is that for a period of time, whether it's a few years or uh, you know as many as 10 years, that he couldn't necessarily recall things. So somehow that the hippocampus was still needed for that retrieval of those memories. So what type of amnesia would that be? So he had a hard time remembering things before the brain damage going back in time. So that's retrograde amnesia. Now I have it starred in both places here to point out to you that, well, the retrograde amnesia he had was not for his entire life. He could remember things from his early childhood. He remembered the bicycle accident that caused the head injury. He could remember um, who his parents were. He could remember the house that he grew up in. So he had those memories. It was really just um, an impact in terms of retrograde for a few years. So it was kind of a partial amnesia. Now, what types of memories are these? What types of memories is it that, he, you know, um, the time that he was riding a bicycle and had an accident, um, the, you know, memories about things that happened in the house that he grew up in? What kind of long-term memories are those? They all sound like episodes from his life, right? So episodic memories. So overall, HM had severe episodic memory impairments. We talked about he couldn't form any new personal recollections after the brain damage, so he had complete anterograde amnesia, and only partial retrograde. So again, note that I have these all starred in all three places. So that was a discussion about his episodic memories, but what about his semantic memories? So Remember, semantic memories are those rules, facts, and concepts. So previously learned semantic memory was mostly intact. So what? So the part that, of his semantic memories that was intact would be those retrograde memories, things from the past, right? However, he was only rem able to remember new simple semantic memories if given a proper cue. So his anterograde semantic memory was not completely intact. It was very um, difficult for him to form new semantic memories, although there was evidence that with, with some very simple ones with cues, he could recall. And here's an example. It's a little excerpt that was taken from an interview 
um, that Dr. Milner did with HM. And so if he would, if Dr. Milner would give HM a prompt such as his initials were JFK, HM could respond Kennedy. If Dr. Milner then asked, well, what was Kennedy's first name? What was his first name? HM would reply John. So there was some evidence that, again, the, you know, knowing who JFK was, he became president after HM had the, the surgery. He was shot after HM had the surgery. So these events take took place afterwards. So he couldn't recall them on their own because, again, that hippocampus is necessary for that retrieval of information. But somehow, perhaps suggesting that semantic memories are stored in a different part of the brain. And that with a cue, then, he could recall them. So we know that his retrograde semantic memories were intact, but that his anterograde ones weren't really intact. They, he had troubles remembering them, and sometimes with a proper cue, he could recall them, but he really didn't have that ability to form these new memories. So are semantic memories explicit or implicit? Are they unconscious? things that we don't realize are influencing us, or are they conscious recollections? They are conscious, they are explicit. So is the hippocampus needed for semantic memories? It's still debated, but based on what we've discussed, the hippocampus plays a role, but the anterior temporal lobe seems to be more important. Whereas, so the, the storage of the semantic memories may be more in this anterior part of the temporal lobe, but the hippocampus may be needed to retrieve those memories. So this one's not quite as, as clear cut. Now, what about HM's procedural memories? They remained intact. So remember, procedural, memory, me, procedural memories are those memories of how to do something. They are not dependent on the hippocampus. And this is a task that's um, discussed in the other video you'll watch, so I'll just skip over it. But this is the way that they knew that his procedural memories were intact, is that not only could he remember how to do things he had, could do before the, the surgery to remove his hippocampus, he could also learn new tasks. He just had absolutely no recollection of having learned them. Now, are procedural memories implicit or explicit? So explicit being conscious recollection, implicit being that unconscious. They're implicit. You're not aware that you're using memory really to do the tasks. You just do them automatically. So procedural memories, like we said previously on the last slide, they don't rely on the hippocampus. They rely on an area called the basal ganglia. Again, it's a memory of how to do something like riding a bike, knowing how to play tennis, um, knowing how to snowboard, knowing how to swim. It's slowly learned and eventually becomes a habit. And we'll come back and talk more about these procedural memories and this area of basal ganglia in the movement chapter. So from what we've talked about thus far, did HM have more impairments in implicit memory or explicit memory? Explicit. His implicit memories were intact. So was HM's short-term memory or working memory impaired? It was not. It also remained intact. So they were able to give him sets of numbers to work with, and as long as he kept working with them, he could hold them in their memory. But if he turned his attention away, they would be gone. And so one story that I've, I've heard and read um, numerous times is they actually thought that, that maybe he was, when they first realized that his working memory was intact, they thought maybe that, um, that, that his memory was coming back. Um, one of the doctors had given him a list of strings, uh, a string of list of a string of numbers and letters to recall, and um, then they got called away. They came back several hours later, and HM was still repeating them over and over again, and they were amazed. But then again, as soon as he turned his attention away, he could no longer remember those um, that string of letters and numbers. Research on the function of the hippocampus suggests that it's very important in what we've been talking about declarative memory functioning, especially the episodic memory. So you take that hippocampus out and that episodic memory is going to be, um, it's going to be detrimental to episodic memories, especially those new memories, right? It also appears to be important in spatial memory. There's actually cells that have been found that they call place cells in the hippocampus that light up and fire action potentials 
when an animal hits a certain spot in a maze, and we assume that we have the same place cells in our brain. It also appears to be especially important for contextual learning and binding. So think about something you've done in the recent past, and, and you think about that memory, and it's got lots of detail. You know, maybe like what you were wearing, who you were with, who you were talking to, lots of details, lots of context to that memory. Now, if you think about something that occurred um, a year ago, you're not going to have, or five years ago, you're not going to have as much context. You're not going to have as much um, detail to it. You have more of a gist of what happened and, you know, just kind of a, a, a gist of the memory. And so that suggests that the hippocampus allows that contextual information to be stored, but then as that information gets moved into cortical regions and is stored as a memory in a cortical region for long term, we lose that context. So we've talked in detail about the role of the hippocampus in episodic memories. And we're not going to talk in any more detail about these two, but your book does have a lot of um, information if you want to learn more.